Uh, hello guys and welcome back. Uh, this is me, Hassan Abdurrahman, uh, one of the FRCM a course academy co-founder and an instructor and hopefully you are doing well. Uh, today's topic we are going to talk about the uh, station of ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support. Uh, we are going to uh, spend some time talking about the minor details of this station and how things can be uh, conducted in the uh, purpose of the exam. So, without further ado, let's start. Uh, first uh, thing, I want to uh, speak a little bit about the concepts of the ATLS. So, the concepts of the ATLS that we have to treat the greatest threat to life first. So, this is our priority. And uh, the lack of definitive diagnosis uh, should never uh, interfere with the application of the indicated medical treatment. Uh, and also the third concept that a detailed history is not essential uh, to begin uh, the evaluation of the patient with acute injuries. So those are the three elements or th three concepts uh, for the trauma uh, patient or the trauma survey. Uh, ATLS is comprised of two aspects, uh, the primary survey and the secondary survey. And they are organized in this manner that as we are doing the primary survey and the secondary survey or the steps itself of the primary survey, it follows the sequence of the evaluation of the most serious injury which can kill the patient first. So the primary survey comprises of A, B, C, D, E. A stands for airway with C-spine protection. B for breathing and ventilation, C for circulation with hemorrhage control, and D for disability, E for exposure. So those are the components of the primary survey, A, B, C, D, E. And they are organized in this manner that we need to treat the greatest threat to life first. For example, if the patient is having airway compromise, this will take priority uh, for of the breathing so we need to fix and we need to treat the airway injury first so that's why they are organized in this manner for the purpose of the exam uh, at least you have to know the steps of the primary survey and just focus on the primary survey so a b c d e so we are going to talk about the how things can be conducted and how things can be organized inside the uh, exam in details. So now we know the primary survey and the secondary survey, usually this is from head to toe examination of the patient. Okay. And uh, there is something called a primary survey adjuncts. What are those? So those are the elements and adjuncts which can help you managing trauma patient. So they are adjuncts. So they are tools for which you can use them to treat your patient optimally. So those adjuncts are chest X-ray, pelvic X-ray, E-fast, ECG, Foley catheter insertion. So those are adjuncts for which you have to mention them and you have to use them because they can give you a valuable results or they can give you, for example, a specific details which can help you managing your patient optimally. So those are the adjuncts of the primary survey. Uh, now let's talk about the station itself and how things can, uh, can be arranged inside the station. So first of all, you have, you have to read your task carefully and you have to understand it. And then inside you will have a one to two assistant. Those will be your, uh, your team. So your task and your role here is to lead the code, to lead the trauma code. So uh, you have to, first uh, of all, you have to read your task. Uh, sometimes you might not identify what type of injury you are going to see or what type of injury you are going to deal with. So you have no any idea. So here you have to be systematic. You have to follow the same primary survey approach. As you are going systemic, systemically, uh, no occult injury can be missed. So first thing, you have to introduce yourself to your team and let them introduce themselves to you. 
and then you have to assign the rules for them that each one uh, can handle a specific task for which you are going to give it to them. Uh, then after that, you have to alert your team that we need to contact a trauma team uh, that we have a trauma patient. And as well, we need to contact the blood bank in case if you are dealing with massive hemorrhage or patient need a transfusion. And also we need to alert the radiology department because we might uh, have uh, or we might transfer patients to CT scanner or any uh, radiology needed. So they will be on board with you. And as well, we have to wear our personal protective equipment and we have to prepare our equipment needed for managing the patient. So this will be your introduction with your team, assigning the rules and give them the clear uh, tasks. Then we have to approach to your patient. Uh, so here first thing you have to follow the sequences of the primary survey, which is A, B, C, D, E. A. So your priority here is the uh, airway. So the first thing you have to uh, maintain in line immobilization and you have to make a conversation with the patient. So to make sure that the patient is talking or not talking. Uh, so if the patient start to communicate with you, that means there is some degree of stability of the airway. But despite though, uh, look, listen, feel, for any noisy breathing or any strider or any harshness of voice and if the patient can maintain the conversation with you so ask the patient to open their mouth widely and you have to look inside the oral cavity and uh, then here uh, for example if the patient is not talking i start to communicate with the patient and there is no answer here so i will follow the same approach so here i'm going to look, listen, feel for breathing. Is the patient breathing or the patient is not breathing at all? So if I can feel breathing in my cheek here, that's mean patient is alive and there is some degree of consciousness, despite though it is reduced, but patient is able to, to breathe. So, so here I'm going to ask my assistant to open the airway by jaw thrust. So here we're going to avoid a head tilt chin lift because we, uh, we might have patient that uh, having a spine injury so we need to make sure that we open the mouth through jaw thrust and then we can see uh, inside the oral cavity if there is any harshness of voice secretions any accessible foreign body at that time can be removed suction can be done and we can apply uh, uh, oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal uh, airway depend on the consciousness of the patient so if the patient have uh, some degree of consciousness so it will be difficult to go for oropharyngeal because patient might start to gag and vomit uh, so we can use an esophageal airway and vice versa if the patient have significant facial trauma which will be a contraindication for application of the nasopharyngeal airway and after that if we stabilize the airway and we did the suction we need to apply high flow oxygen and prior to this uh, we need to uh, maintain the inline immobilization or fixation of the C-spine with a uh, C-collar. So he asked your colleague to uh, insert the C-spine, C-collar, and followed by application of the head blocks and tape. So this is called triple immobilization. And now we have to apply high flow oxygen via non-rebreather mask. So here, at this moment, you have to make sure that you are happy with the airway and everything is fixed. So the sequences and the, the concepts as well for the ATLS or trauma patient, you are not moving from any system to other unless you fix everything. So don't move, for example, from the airway to breathing if you have problem still in the breathing or if you didn't fix the problem in the airway. You cannot move to breathing and so on. For example, if you have problem in the breathing, this should be fixed first before moving to the circulation and so on. If you are happy with the airway, everything is fine. You uh, can move forward to the breathing. So now the next step when coming to the breathing, make sure that your patient have been connected to the cardiac monitor at this moment. So now we are going to handle the breathing. So here, 
some people might ask me, so during this situation, how things can be conducted? Uh, for example, if I want to know the vital signs of the patient or if I know the specific, for example, blood pressure or, or SpO2 or respiratory rate. So here the examiner is following you. So, okay. And just follow the sequence and do your assessment. And if you want to know about something, just tell them what is the SpO2 of the patient and immediately the answer will be with you. So he's following you, okay? Uh, just focus on your assessment. All the answer you needed, uh, you will have it. So now in the breathing, we have to do many things in the breathing. So we need to know the vital signs. As well, we need to do our assessment and we need to give our orders. How things can be arranged here? Because here some people might get some confusion. So shall I do the assessment first? Expose, inspect, auscultate, percuss the chest, or I have to ask about the vital signs first, or I have to give my orders for X-ray. So how can we arrange our thoughts in this situation? So for this purpose, I recommend you that you can follow the sequences of ask, do, ask. What does that mean? Ask for the initial set of vital signs. When you're coming to the breathing, first thing, ask about the full set of vitals. Ask your colleague, can I have the SpO2 and the respiratory rate and the blood pressure of the patient, please, at this level? Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to expose the chest. So here, you are, you ask about the full set of vital signs. Why this is important? For example, you finish the airway and you connect it to the patient to the 50 liter oxygen via non-rebreather mask. And now I came to the breathing part. I ask about the vital signs of the patient. For example, the SpO2. If they mention for me that the SpO2 is 88, now I am recognizing that I'm going to find something in the breathing because this patient on, on high flow oxygen, I put him on 15 before coming to the breathing. Now I'm assessing the breathing before starting. They give me a set of vitals with the SpO2 of 88, meaning I'm going to find something in the breathing part. So here, now you have the full set of vitals. Ask, ask about the full set of vitals. Do, what to do? Do your assessment and your, your examination. Do include that you have to expose the chest fully, you have to inspect, you have to auscultate, you have to percuss, you have to palpate as well. And then ask or give your orders. If you want to order a chest x-ray, if you, you want to do some specific uh, procedure, for example, chest drain insertion or aspiration or uh, de uh, decompression of tension in the thorax or anything, or if asked, you have uh, to ask at the end. So the sequences will be ask, do, ask. Ask for so full set of vitals, do your assessment, ask and give your orders if you want to do anything uh, for you, for example, to be arranged for you. So following these sequences, things will be much more organized with you and you will find no difficulties and you will not forget anything because if you are not organized in this entity, there are, there are many things here needs to be done. Examination, assessment, full set of vitals, giving orders. You might forget something. But if you follow these sequences, nothing will be forgotten and you're going to collect the full marks. Uh, in this lecture, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the specific injuries. Okay, uh, Rather, I'm going to talk about the general approach. Okay, So... If you found any problem at this level, yes, you can, you can fix it. I recommend also in the breathing part now here, you can ask about the adjuncts of the primary survey, which we mentioned them earlier. Okay, if you cannot, uh, if you are systemic in the breathing part, you can order for chest X-ray and EFAST. In the circulation part, you can order for the EFAST and pelvic X-ray. But I recommend you to not forget once you are in the breathing, order all of them together. You can order your chest X-ray, your pelvic X-ray, you can ask for EFAST, and you can ask for ECG and connect the patient to the cardiac monitor. So like this, yeah, 
you collect all the marks uh, with regard to the adjuncts of the primary survey. Right. If you found any problem, do not move forward to the circulation unless you fix the problem in the uh, breathing part. Make sure that your patient is stable uh, enough, which makes you happy to move to the circulation. Uh, now we can uh, talk about the uh, circulation. If you you finish the breathing part, you can move to the uh, circulation. In the circulation part here also, we are going to follow the same aspects. Ask, do, ask. Ask again about the full set of vitals, right? And then do your assessment, do by removal or removal of any clothes, uh, exposure, expose the abdomen and the pelvic area, and uh, evaluate or inspect the area itself, and then you have to go for uh, palpation, and you have to go for a full assessment of the pelvic area of the abdomen, pelvic, and long bones. So circulation includes the abdomen, pelvic, and long bones if you found any problem here and uh, you have to fix it and correct it at this level they might provide you with uh, an image or e fast or a pelvic x-ray or anything so your management will be according to the type of injury discovered okay so if the patient is having for example intra-abdominal uh, bleeding so here you have to contact the general surgery and you have to contact the theater that patient might need a laparotomy particularly if the patient is uh, quite hypotensive and here you have to insert your two IV lines and you have to specify what type of blood you want it uh, group and safe cross matching UNEs full blood count and you have to give uh, the patient fluid and you have to give the patient tranexamic acid as well. So there is a controversy regarding tranexamic acid. Uh, but some people, they are saying that it have no any effect. People are saying that it is very effective, uh, particularly if patient is bleeding heavily. Uh, I think the dose is one gram uh, over 10 minutes followed by one gram over uh, eight hours. But my concept and our target here to switch to the blood product early and we have to notify the blood, blank, blood bank early that the patient is uh, bleeding profusely and also if the patient have any active area of bleed this should be controlled okay and we have to give the initial one liter of uh, fluid uh, right so if the patient is having long bone deformity for example femur deformity obvious with no external wounds so here mostly we are dealing with close uh, femur injury or close any long bone injury so in such situation you have to make sure that we need to check the distal pulsation before and after attempting reduction so if there is an obvious deformity, for example, in the right femur, we have to check the pulsation. There is pulsation, yes or no. If there is no pulsation here, we have to attempt reduction using Thomas splint or any splint uh, to reduce the bone back and followed by rechecking of the pulse. Now we have pulse, yes or no. If we have no pulse, meaning that we are dealing with uh, acute limb injury, uh, acute limb ischemia, might happen uh, so we need to contact the vascular and orthopedician uh, urgently to be attend with us and if the patient is having for example perceived edges of the bone outside so we are talking about open fracture here do not attempt to reduce the bone back so because the bone here might need or the wound might need frequent irrigation with the fluid and fluid and also Sometimes the reduction might be done in the theater. So your target here is just to control the bleeding and apply moist sterile dressing over the first edges of the bone, but do not attempt to reduce it back. But we have to check the distal pulsation uh, presence. Uh, so now we can uh, move to the disability. Uh, if we are happy with the circulation and there is no any uh, problem which have been fixed or if we fix any problem in the circulation and we are happy 
now we can move forward to disability. Disability including what? Disability including the checking of the GCS of the patient, uh, checking for any neurological uh, finding, for example, uh, we have to check for the pupils, uh, any signs of lateralization, and uh, we need to check the RBS, and as I mentioned before, uh, GCS of the patient. And also, we need to ask the patient if the patient has some degree of consciousness to move the forelimbs to check if there is any neurodeficit, because sometimes we might face a type of injury which is uh, for example, hyperextended injury to the neck, particularly in the elderly, for which you are talking about the central cord syndrome. So, the patient have a specific weakness. Uh, so, we have to ask the patient to move the four limbs to check for any neurodeficit, indicating that the patient is having either raised intracranial pressure or the patient is having a spinal a spinal injury. And at this level also, it is time to augment the patient with analgesia. So in the disability part, we can give analgesia at this level. So because sometimes you might face that while you are doing your airway, breathing, circulation, patient might ask, please give me painkiller. I'm in pain. So here at this level, you can provide the patient with the painkiller. Your painkiller should be strong. Do not prescribe, for example, weak analgesics like paracetamol and if the patient is having heavy trauma. So go for opioid, either a fentanyl or a morphine. And during the survey, in any uh, trauma or major code, you have to give your order clear with the dosage and route. So lastly, now we finish the airway, breathing, circulation, disability. Now we have to talk about the exposure. Exposure, this is ex uh, we have to expose the patient fully from head to toe and doing full examination and assessment and to not uh, miss any occult injury. Uh, plus, we need to uh, control the temperature of the patient. So those are the concepts of the primary survey. So airway, breathing, uh, circulation, disability, and exposure. Some people might ask me, if the patient is bleeding heavily from the beginning, shall we follow the sequences of C, A, B, C, D, E, or what to do. If it is clearly and obviously that the patient is bleeding heavily in front of you because the patient has amputation or anything, you have to apply direct pressure. If the patient is bleeding profusely, just apply direct pressure and then follow the sequences of the A, B, C, D, E. But for the purpose of the exam, still we are going with the same all sequences, which is airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and, and exposure. So those are the concepts. As you are going systematically, now no other injury can be missed from you. So like this, you'll be organized. Uh, your approach will be optimal, and no inactive injury can be missed from your side. Uh, here I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, tips uh, in the ATLS. We're going to cover them. So we will start to talk about them one by one. Uh, so trauma, uh, in the ATLS I mean, uh, it's also cover the burn. So burn is a part of the ATLS of the trauma. So in burn station, uh, we have to check that if the patient is having, for example, a burn in his trunk, we need to make sure uh, the burn is circumferential, yes or no. Because if we are talking about circumferential burn in the chest, so mostly we, are, we will have a patient who is having some sort of difficulty breathing and tightness of the chest wall movement. So they might give you a tachypneic patient with high respiratory rate with and low saturation. So here we have to consider that we need to go for scrotomy. Uh, for such patient to relieve the tension of the chest wall. Uh, also, in uh, burn station, uh, regarding the Parkland formula and the fluid assessment, you have to mention to your team that now we are going to give the patient a bolus of the fluid as a trauma survey, and we need to calculate the full burn percentage and to start the Parkland formula or start giving fluid by Parkland formula in the secondary survey. 
and this also if we need to give any tetanus textoid should be on the uh, secondary survey but you have to mention and you have to verbalize this to your team while you are doing your assessment so like this the examiner is knowing that you are aware about this issue and this issue is not uh, forgotten from your side uh, the other thing which we already mentioned before that do not forget to ask the patient <coughs> to move his four limbs to not miss any central cord uh, syndrome uh, if we face that we had a patient with extreme head injury and there is sign of symptoms of raised intracranial pressure so also here we need to verbalize this to our team that the patient is having for example uh, raised intracranial pressure elements if the patient is having ipsilateral pupillary dilatation hemiplegia uh, contralateral uh, or uh, any uh, decreased level of consciousness we need to mention for our team that patient our patient is suffering from the uh, mostly head injury so and patient is experiencing a raging intracranial pressure we need to manage the patient with hypertonic saline at uh, three percent so hypertonic saline is preferred in the trauma settings instead of the manitol but all of them are correct and uh, how we need to mention as well that we need to prevent a secondary brain injury by maintaining normoxia normocapnia and uh, communicate this verbally with our team while we are uh, managing the code if we if we finish our survey for example our uh, primary survey and the patient have significant injury with gcs for example of nine and patient need to be transferred for the ct scan so better to proceed with the intubation but this is at the end do not rush yourself for initial intubation this is at the end if we finish the airway breathing circulation disability and exposure and now we face that the patient having low gcs and patient need to be transferred to the ct scanner so better to secure the airway before moving because this is considered to be one of the indication of the in intubation uh, the other tip if they provide you with the vital signs for example or the vital signs show hypertension bradycardia and irregular respiration so also this is a science of uh, uh, cushing patient is uh, having cushing signs or cushing reflex indicating raised icp immediately i recommend you to verbalize this issue to your team i know that you you nail it that there is a cushing reflex but you have to verbalize this to your team and to show the examiner that you understand that this patient having raised icp and this is called cushing so like this you will demonstrate that you are expert and you have an enough knowledge uh, for leading this code and you have enough information and uh, so like this things you will have a better communication with your team while you are running the code other tip uh, in case of the hemothorax uh, and they show you an x-ray and provided you with the vital signs uh, and the x-ray and uh, the situation is going toward the hemothorax and you insert a chest drain immediately better to ask how much uh, blood have been drained after the insertion of the chest tube because we need to contact the cardiothoracic surgeon uh, if we have a drainage of more than one and a half liter immediately or the patient is having uh, blood loss of uh, 200 ml uh, for more to four to six hours so also this is an indication for cardiothoracic surgeon uh, consultation uh, so in cardiac tamponade or penetrating thoracic injury uh, also this is uh, considered to be one of the indication uh, to contact the cardiothoracic surgeon if we have a patient for example with a pelvic uh, injury we need to apply a pelvic binder this is will help to reduce the volume of the pelvic and at the same time to tamponade uh, any uh, bleeding point 
uh, until the patient can be have a definitive uh, management. Uh, how to apply the pelvic binder? So pelvic binder will be applied, for example, uh, you are holding the binder from the one side and your colleague is holding the binder from the other side. We are coming from the feet of the patient, slide it beneath his feet, we are going cephalt toward the pelvic. When we reach to the uh, area of the greater trichander, at that level we are going to wrap the sheet and to decrease the pelvic of the volume, uh, the volume of the pelvic and uh, to make sure we control the bleeding. So, uh, if the patient, for example, is having a pelvic injury, this is considered to be a contraindication for log rolling. And we mentioned before that if the patient is having fracture, open fracture, it is contraindication for splinting. For example, patient with open femur fracture, it is contraindicated to apply a Thomas splint because we mentioned priorly that things. Uh, need to be done in the theater under a sterile condition and patient might need a heavy irrigation of the wound before attempting reduction. Right. So don't forget the adjuncts, uh, the adjuncts of the primary survey because uh, this is easy mark. Don't try to lose any easy mark. And uh, while, for example, uh, other tip, uh, while you are palpating the chest wall and palpating the abdomen uh, in the breathing and the uh, circulation respectively, don't forget to put your hands on the back of the patient uh, because sometimes and uh, we might find that after putting your hands on the back, there is blood in your gloves, indicating that there is occult injury in the back so do not forget to do this because you can forget an occult injury in the back and patient might bleed profusely and you are not aware about that uh, in trauma sitting with raised icp uh, we mentioned priorly that we can uh, maintain uh, the patient with uh, or to give the patient hypertonic saline uh, to reduce the icp and also uh, one of the parameters and measurements which can be done to decrease the ICP that we can uh, manage the patient on a 25 degree reversed uh, Trindelenburg position, head up and uh, so because we cannot raise the head of the patient or the head of the bed up. Rather, we can use the 25 degree reversed Trindelenburg head injury. Uh, in the case of the stab wound to the abdomen with the evisceration, of the interabdominal contents, do not do not try to reduce them back into the abdomen. So this is by itself indication for uh, laparotomy. So don't try to reduce them back because you can reintroduce the infection inside the abdomen. So just cover it with a sterile moist dressing and contact the general surgery immediately uh, to prepare for the theater because the patient is having a clear indication for uh, laparotomy. So those are the general tips uh, and uh, approach for the uh, uh, trauma patient, advanced trauma life support. Uh, hopefully you found this uh, record uh, useful and wishing uh, to talk to you uh, soon. Stay well. Bye-bye.